Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another uh, bi-weekly uh, HubSpot Hacks. Um, great having uh, Pete Caputo, the CEO of Databox, with us. Um, I've known Pete for quite a while, back in the day, when we started as a partner in 2014, um, uh, running the program at HubSpot. Since then, he'll... I'm going into a bit of detail, has moved on to uh, very interesting things in the last couple of years. Um, so as we, this is around AI-powered analytics, and we've been working with Databox also and HubSpot for, um, I think, probably since, uh, since Pete started working with them. years, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five, five or so years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's been, re- it's been really interesting and to see and to follow you guys and see how um things have progressed and um become a big company already um and a very powerful tool especially uh take into account that everything kind of starts with analytics uh, unfortunately maybe not everything starts with the analytics they actually start with let's make sure the database is clean and all of, but in the essence it should start with analytics because in the end that's uh, the deliverable with everything coming from the crm and uh, we're going to into a lot of detail. So, uh, Pete, maybe just introduce yourself and then uh, sure. we can kick this off. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, most likely for everyone. It's morning over here in the U.S. I'm outside of Boston, but good afternoon, everyone in uh, Europe. I'm used to working with uh, with people all over the world. We actually have uh, about 130 people in 17 different countries of Databox. So I'm always trying to calculate time zones, but good afternoon to everyone. Uh, as Mark said, um, I spent uh, nine years at HubSpot. Um, I started the pro the partner program there uh, and built that organization up to several hundred people where I led both sales marketing and um, and helped with uh, customer support for our partners as well as uh, as well as product direction in order to support the partners as well. So um, got had a front row seat. I was the fifteenth employee there and and uh, left uh, helped build up that organization when I when I left. My part of the organization was around a $200 million business. I imagine many of you are HubSpot users. Um, and so I thank you for being a HubSpot user because uh, I'm still very long on HubSpot, very bullish on, on HubSpot as a company and a product. We're uh, both a uh, HubSpot customer, all, all the hubs, uh, and um, and also um, the number one uh, apps, app partner. So about six years ago, uh, I left HubSpot. I was looking for another entrepreneurial challenge. I uh, ended up joining Databox, which is a pre-revenue company, had a product, but but really hadn't taken it out to market um, and been there ever since. We've grown to about 3,000 uh, customers or so. Uh, many of our customers are agencies um, like Penguin, a longtime partner of Databox as well. And, uh, and many of them use us to report results to tens of thousands of companies. So overall, we've been uh, helping tens of thousands of companies uh, over the last several years, consolidate um, all of their performance data into one spot so they can then monitor, set goals against it, report out to stakeholders, et cetera. Um, and today, uh, Mark and, and Perry at Penguin asked me to come on and talk about some of the new stuff we're working on. So warning, some of this stuff is in progress, um, but we'll talk about how we're, uh, we've been developing and we're about to launch a bunch of AI-powered features that will hopefully make uh, using analytics a lot easier for lots and lots of businesses. So with that, I think we can jump in. So I'm good, Mark? Yeah, that'll be great. I think uh, this is a big pain point for most people out there. So anything we learn today will be uh, implemented as quickly as possible, if, if, if possible, and at least uh, the right way of thinking of things, I think is also very important. Yeah. You know, I'm empathetic to that. Uh, it's, it's my job, our job, we consider it our job to make analytics easier for people. It's hard. Uh, and so we'll talk about that today. I appreciate everybody uh, who showed up today to talk about a hard subject. Um, but today I'm going to cover three things. Uh, Mark and I will go back and forth here. And if you have questions, please pop them in the chat pane. Uh, number one, uh, we'll talk about performance management habits. If you haven't read like Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, I highly recommend that book. It's been around forever. It's tried and true. Uh, business professional book. Uh, we've kind of adapted that. We did this intense study uh, and identified performance management habits of highly successful companies. So a little play on their, on their, uh, on, on the book title there. Uh, next, I'm going to go into why AI for analytics, why we should be thinking about AI for analytics. The 
generative AI space is really hot, meaning people are using AI to help them outline or edit or even write certain content, um, generating text, right? People are using AI to create uh, images. Uh, you might might have tried uh, Mid Journey, for example, it creates an amazing imagery, uh, which you used to have to you know work with a designer to do. I'm not saying it's going to replace writers or designers, but there's a lot of hot uh, activity there. Um, AI was actually even is even better suited for processing data. Uh, that's really all AI is doing. Uh, and so there's a bigger opportunity, we believe, for companies to leverage AI to help um, manage their performance, analyze their performance, and improve their performance over time. Uh, and third, um, I'll talk about some very practical ways that AI can help you in your business uh, to help with performance and uh, performance management and really help you not just execute your strategy, but help you build a really good strategy and then execute it um, more effectively. So I'll jump in. So we did this uh, survey in 2022, published in 2023. We surveyed more than 300 companies uh, and we asked them about 40 questions on how they manage performance in their company, how they monitor performance across the organization, how they uh, report that performance, uh, how they set goals, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to walk you through um, the seven things that we identified that the top performing companies did. So we looked at the survey and we identified about a third of the sample who seemed to outperform the other the rest of the sample. And we looked at that in multiple ways. One is they achieved more of the goals that they set. Two, they're also tended to be the bigger company. So you can assume bigger companies, uh, more revenue, more successful. And three, these companies have been around for a, for a longer time. So of course there are startups that are way more successful than your average business. Uh, and there are small companies that are highly profitable, but we used those three metrics, the goal, goal achievement, size of the company and age of the company as a, a proxy for identifying the companies that were top performers. And then what we did is we looked and see what are the things that they're doing that maybe they're doing more or more frequently than the rest of the sample does in order to identify those seven, uh, these seven habits. And we did it with an open mind, right? We started with 40 questions. So it could have, could have been 70 habits. It could have been two habits. It could have been seven different habits, but we let the data uh, dictate uh, exactly what, what those habits were. Um, as Great. a data company, you imagine we'd, we'd be fairly good at this. Um, but number one um, is that the question is, are you tracking the right metrics? Uh, it seems that um, companies really struggle with this. And we live this day in and day out. When someone signs up for our product, the first thing we do is to offer to help them build dashboards and build reports. Uh, and uh, many of them don't have a clue on what metrics they want to track. So oftentimes we're the ones recommending, right? If you're working with, a, with an agency like Penguin, one of the first things they're going to do is use their vast experience of not just tracking metrics, but improving them and tell you or recommend which metrics you should be tracking. Uh, and so what we found is that the companies that outperformed the, the sample, uh, they were much more confident in the metrics that they were tracking. So uh, they, they just, they knew that they were tracking the right stuff. Um, whereas companies that are less successful just are still unclear. So that's one of the first things that you got to figure out is which metrics should we be tracking in our business? Uh, one of the things that's great- What does that mean the right yeah. metrics? Sorry, I'm stopping yeah. there for one second. Yeah, no problem. The right no problem. metrics is, is specific for that company or because they knew what they wanted to track uh, instead of another company was, that was so like all over the place. So this question was really around the confidence, right? How confident are you as a company that you're tracking the right things? And confident yeah they could be cocky and just say yeah i'm confident and they might not have a clue right but in general this is a good question to ask people to determine whether they're they're doing it right um in our in my experience um you know there there's there's a lot of metrics that are come out of the box in software now right just 20 years ago you'd have to invent metrics, right? There was like two software programs that had standardized metrics. Now, pretty much every software program has kind of a standardized metric that can give you a proxy for your performance. Um, but as you know, also, Mark, you know, when you start building your own sales and marketing strategy for your market, et cetera, there may be metrics that you need to track that are unique or custom metrics you need to build. Uh, and so I think it's a combination of those two things. 
Um, it's never a straightforward thing. I don't think I have it in my seven habits, but one of the things that we see companies do that are more successful with our product is they're revisiting the metrics that they're tracking at least once a quarter. Um, and they're saying, hey, are we tracking the right stuff? Should we be drilling down a little bit differently? Should we be capturing data a little differently so that we can analyze it differently? We're running this experiment. How are we going to measure? So we're validating experiment? all yeah. the time. So it's Got a it. part of the of, of the cycle. But but you can get pretty far sitting down, you know, for a, a concentrated period of time with your team or with experts like Penguin and and using the out of the box metrics um, and just start, you know, I just start with those processes start. and systems that will help improve those. Yep. Got it. So that's that's number one. Number two is a financial model. And this is this is really hard. I think there's so many different ways that you can improve performance of a business, but you have to put some time into the math that says if we do X, we can expect Y, whether that's growing your revenue or growing your margins. It's important to whip out a spreadsheet and put some of your historical data in there, project some forward. And try to figure out, how, you know, where can we end if we invest in certain things, right? It's really the job, of, my job at Databox is figure out how to invest the money we have in in improving our business, you know, growing our business margins and revenue. Same thing Perry's and the management team and Penguin team is, uh, I'm sure, doing is thinking they're thinking where should we invest our money and time in order to improve our business. And so one of the things that the top performing companies did that, that at a much higher rate was, was have a financial model. Uh, like we have a financial model at Databox. I literally change it, like something about it every three months at least. Oftentimes, sometimes it's even more frequently. So it's a living, breathing thing. Um, but uh, companies that do this are, are outperforming. Um, the third one is setting a larger number of goals. I think there's, there's this, um, I think, somewhat dated uh, advice out there that you should only have a small number of goals in your business. Um, in reality, you should probably have, depending on the size of your organization, tens, maybe hundreds of goals. And every person in your organization should be focused on improving some metric. Now, there might be multiple people focused on one metric. That's always a good thing. Um, but everyone should be focused on improving metrics. And you need to break it down so that it's not just, hey, we have a revenue goal or, hey, we have a sales goal. But you need to figure out what are the activities that go on before that, before that deal is created, before that sale is made. That will ultimately influence uh, that that the, those deal volume or sales. So things like publishing the number of blog posts or writing a certain number of posts or recording a certain number of videos for LinkedIn, like all of these things can be goals. And the companies that have more goals are the ones that um, seem to be more effective at hitting their goals. So they also smart and actionable goals that are part of the process to get to your end goal. So if I say like uh, an overall goal of improving revenue or increasing revenue by 20% year on end, that's fine. But, but without tracking all the goals, how you're going to get there, you'll never be able to optimize and see and, and, and improve. If yeah, I understand, yeah, that's yeah. kind of what you're saying. Exactly. We are, early on, like six years, five, six years ago, when we, when we were building or you know, when I joined Databox um, and we had dashboards uh, built, but we didn't have a goals feature. And it was like the most highly requested feature. And I thought, oh, we're going to launch a goals feature and everybody's going to start setting goals properly, right? Uh, doing it with smart goals, like you referenced, right? Specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, time bound. Uh, and if they're do, like we figured we built a tool that allows you to literally enter a smart goal, enter different goals for different time periods, et cetera. Uh, it, it's, it's not used by 50% of our customers, unfortunately. It's like most companies are still not setting, setting any goals, let alone, you know, as many goals as they should be setting. Um, and yes, it's important to make them smart. <laughs> All right. Number four, um, are you monitoring performance daily and reviewing performance in meetings? These are two habits of highly, highly successful companies. Um, and they're using generally using live dashboards where you can monitor the data very easily. It's, a, it's a, you, you know, create dashboards that have maybe metrics from multiple tools if you need that. Um, maybe some marketing, some sales metrics, some finance metrics, et cetera. And that's a common view that's shared across the company, as well as maybe, you know, team specific dashboards that allow them to monitor exactly how they're performing or allow a manager of that team to monitor exactly how that team's performing so they can spot things on a daily basis and course correct. Um, and then the other habit um, that at least 60% of these top performing companies do 
about 60% of these top performing companies do, uh, is they review review the performance in meetings, discuss it, hold people accountable to the numbers that are the, the goals that are set, and also discuss ways that they can um, they can either hit the goal or improve further. Uh, and so those two two activities uh, seem to show up at a higher rate. That, amongst top of that's very interesting because, like you know, the basic thing you would be okay. Let's present everything once a month and have a meeting. So by the time you try to course correct, the next month has already gone by and you've already missed the opportunity. You're saying yeah. it's daily, weekly, obviously is. Is, is, is to pick up the trends, pick up the things that need to, to course correct and then do it immediately. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, no, so um, I, uh, we we recommend, the cadence we recommend and seems to be most common amongst companies is to set quarterly uh, plans and goals. So you sit down every 90 days and say, hey, what should we do different this quarter? What should we do more of? What should we do less of? Et cetera. Where should we invest our resources differently? Generally, those are small changes. You might take on one new project, two new projects, something like that. Um, but then, and then you break that quarterly goal down to a monthly goal. And that monthly goal, because it's monthly, it drives a little more accountability. It of course gets assigned to someone, and then that person or that team should be monitoring their progress on a daily basis, right? And if they need help with that, discussing that with their team on a weekly basis. Um, so I think it's a good cadence for, especially for a sales organization. I, I, I believe for a marketing organization, although marketers Thanks. seem to report their data less frequently. All right. Um, number five, are you monitoring and reporting results for all your key functions? So as CEO, I need to monitor how the whole team is performing, right? Uh, in our business, as a software business, I have, literally have about 30 different functions. Uh, and of course, they're broken up into five major functions, marketing, sales, customer uh, so customer success, product, engineering, et cetera, HR. Uh, so um, what we've seen in this report is that the top performing companies generally are looking um, at a, a wide range of metrics. Um, and as you can see here, marketing actually was more popular than sales even. Um, I think what's happened over the last 10, 20 years is marketing has so many tactics and and it and money has moved in that way as it should um, away from maybe sales a little bit and uh, everything is very measurable now that doesn't mean everything's perfectly controllable there's a lot of algorithms that control the way the world works that uh, none of us really have a good grasp on but uh, marketing is is really a, is a number one thing that should be uh, monitored and reported. Uh, sales is a very very close second. So and obviously every company knows they need to monitor and report their sales. Finance being uh, third, and you can see they're all very neck and neck. Customer success or customer support service uh, right there, and then you can see a, a long a list of other functions that different types of organizations uh, monitor and report. Um, and now the you can see on that chart the light blue is monitor and the dark blue is report. So you can see. A lot of, uh, I'm sorry, the dark blue is both monitor and report and the light blue is just report. So really what's happened over the last say 10, 15 years is that companies have moved away from just reporting to either monitoring more frequently or monitoring and reporting. Um, and you know, it goes back to what we were just talking about a second ago, Mark, is like if you set that goal, a monthly goal or a quarterly goal, and then you wait to, to report on it, it's too late. There's nothing you can do. The best you're going to do is change it in the next 90 day cycle. But if you assign responsibility to individuals or teams and they monitor that performance, there's much better chance that they'll actually uh, achieve the target or improve the results by the end of the quarter. And so that's why many companies, you can see that dark blue line are doing both monitoring and reporting. So they got the dashboard with the goals and, you know, how far are they to, to, to receive that and they can look at that on a daily basis and say, okay, are we in the right direction or not? Yeah. Yeah. So obviously there's lots of different ways to monitor your data. If you're using good tools, right. Um, and data, as you know, with data box, we allow people to pull that data into one spot. About a year ago, we also launched a reporting feature to allow people to take what they were monitoring and very easily create reports that they can run, write re recommendations and next steps on interpret the data, et cetera, and then present in a meeting. So, um, it's important that those functions are together. If you're if you're monitoring over here, then you're most likely very manually building reports over here in Google Docs or PowerPoint or slides or whatever. Uh, and and you can really streamline those if you think about them as one one uh, one set of dashboards that ultimately become your report. 
Go ahead. Uh, number okay. six, are you monitoring results frequently enough? And so this goes back to what we were just talking about. The top performing companies are monitoring much more frequently. Um, yep. Yeah, so the yeah, at least once per month. Um, you can see that there's many companies in there on the daily and weekly basis uh, as well. Our most successful customers, and I think they're probably at the extreme of data-driven organizations, are monitoring their data at least four times a week. So we have a good portion of our customers that are looking at their dashboards at least four times a week. We have some customers, of course, that look at them 20, 30 times a week, um, you know, multiple times per day. But um, many, many companies are, and some, you know, some companies use our TV dashboards to put the 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 data up on a dashboard and literally like look at it, you know, 50 times live. On the sales floor or whatever. So um, I think more is better as long as you can control uh, the result, right? If you're staring at your revenue number all day, you're looking at it 50 times. Uh, meanwhile, like there's really little you can do today to improve, increase your revenue because you close four $1 million deals a year. Like that's not a good use of your time. But if you're closing 100 transactions a month or even 10 transactions a month and you need, you know, 100 or a few hundred deals and you need maybe a few hundred leads to do that, then monitoring all the activities that you're doing and the results earlier in your funnel or uh, more frequently is, is important. That's what I was going to say. I, I'm sure it's specific also to the business model if I'm a SaaS company, e-commerce, uh, yeah. uh, or if I'm a B2B, as you said, enterprise where I'm closing four or five deals a year. Exactly. The, the net cadence of of, of the changes in in, in 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 the analytics is going to is going is going to differ. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that the enterprise focus one should stop. Right. As you know, marketing can be really key there, and the activities that a marketing team does on a daily basis can help with generating traffic, high intent traffic, high qualified leads. So focusing in on some of those earlier. Um, activities and earlier leading indicators can it, for maybe, sure. Maybe it, it's it's the opposite. They just need to focus on on on, on different metrics and numbers. Yeah. Exactly. Right. How many people are closed in the deal? How yeah. many people are engaging? Um, you know, for mm -hmm. sure. Nope. Right. And the last um, habit of of top performing companies in our survey sample is that they're creating comprehensive reports. Um, we define metrics uh, in Databox uh, in diff by, by different types. So um, I think a lot of people get overwhelmed. What we discovered years ago is a lot of people get overwhelmed by just all the data. And it's hard to make sense of it if you're just looking at lots of different metrics, especially if you really don't intimately understand what the metric means or how you influence that metric or how metrics are related. Uh, and so what we did is we created a framework for trying to bucket metrics into different things. Um, Outcome metrics is what most people are, are familiar with. I'm, I'm looking at this chart now here. Outcome metrics is what most people are familiar with. That's the revenue. That's the deals closed. Uh, in marketing, that might mean the traffic or leads that you get. Those are the outcome metrics. It, it depends on your function, but they're, they're the results that you produce from your work. Uh, quality metrics are often conversion rate, rates. So not always, but often conversion rates. They're the things that tell you the quality of your work. So if you're producing lots of content on your website, but it's not converting into leads, that's pretty. Uh, that's a, that's not high quality. You're not necessarily doing the right thing. Uh, and so you might need to go back to the drawing board and say, what content I'm producing? What's my offers? What's my conversion path? Et cetera, all stuff that I know Peng has years and years of experience doing. Um, but quality metrics are an indication of the whether the things that you're doing are actually producing results for you. Output metrics are the things you do. So all of us have things to do every day or every week or every month that will make, help us make progress. Um, and by focusing some people on output metrics, um, it allows them to focus and just do a good job, right? I have a team, for example, at Databox um, that all they do uh, all day is they chat with our free users and offer to help them with setup. We have the same t team that does that with our customers as well. And we offer the same level of support uh, there. It's actually a little more advanced there. Um, uh, but basically we're in chat all day. And so that's their job. Their job is to help people get set up in the product via chat. Um, and so by giving them an output of say, hey, you should probably handle this many chats in a day, it, give, it gives them a focus. Uh, and it also ensures that the work that they're doing will result uh, in our case, into sales calls uh, booked for our sales team um, or people just buying because some people just buy without talking to our sales team. 
Uh, and then there are input metrics. Those are the things that executives generally control. Uh, may, sometimes to maybe the chagrin of the people that work for them, but things like investing in paid ads or not, right? Or how much you invest in paid ads, things like adding headcount to a specific team. Um, and those are the investments we make. So if you kind of go backwards and you say, hey, we start with figuring out what investments we're going to make. We then we determine the activities that we're going to do. Then we make sure that the quality of that work is high. And then we monitor the results. And if you start to bucket your metrics in those ways, it allows people to think a little bit more like a system and really understand the system a little bit better. It also provides a common terminology or methodology that you can use internally to make sense of all the numbers as you as you review them or report on them. Uh, there's some other reporting best practices that are really valuable, such as comparing your performance to previous periods. It's amazing how many tools make that hard. Um, there are other software tools, I won't name any, some that we love um, that make it impossible for you to look and see how does this 30 day period compare to the 30 day period before, or how does this 30 day period this year compare to the 30 day year period before uh, last year, or how does this year compare to last year, quarter to quarter, et cetera. But those are important. Uh, that gives you get directional to see how you're doing progress towards goals, as we talked about before. And then in that report, there should be some amount of analysis and, and recommendations. So some written explanation of what actually you did and how it worked, as well as next steps and recommendations. So that's what a good report looks like. Uh, the final habit here of these companies is that the top performing companies do add more of these things into their reports than the companies um, who are less successful. So those I are- I have a question about, about the comprehensive report. So you're finding that um, obviously on the C-level, like as you said, the CEO, you have one report like that, looking at the entire business, and then you'll probably have one like that per- uh, department. So I have one for marketing, one for sales, and then maybe that breaks down into, you know, the SDR or the A or the sales team. So for each of those, I can actually have every, everything you put here, outcome, uh, outputs, conversion rates, input metrics, all of that, correct? Yeah. Yes, exactly. And then I can every optimize department per department to see what's which one's going. What activities are we doing? Uh, how, what's the quality of that work and, and how's, how's that resulting in business results for us? Yes. Great. And, Excellent. Yeah. And then of course, connect those functions, right? So marketing as you should have a very tight connection with sales. Um, sales will have impact on retention or, or customer success, whatever you call it. Um, so those things should be connected as well. There should be quality metrics around the sales process and sales conversation that ultimately will help you identify, uh, you know, identify um, areas that you might need a, a customer time to close and, yeah. and yeah. so on as well. Got it. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. All right. Um, any, do we have any questions or anything? I don't know where we're doing on time. Uh, don't have my uh, phone on me. Let's <laughs> see the time. But is it, um, we, we the next 30 minutes have gone past. So okay. we have, we have a good uh, 20, 25 minutes to get through the rest. Uh, cool. Yeah. In the meantime, I, uh, unless Perry's seeing something I'm not seeing, any questions? I think everyone's listening so far. Sure. Um, but, right, we haven't yeah, bored them to that yet. Great. <laughs> All right, let's get yeah, into the fun stuff. So let's talk a little bit about why uh, why AI is perfectly suited to help with analytics and performance management inside companies. Um, there's three reasons. Uh, if you have other reasons that you think would work, I'd love to hear them. But these are the three reasons that we've been thinking about over the last few years as we started building out our data science team, um, and building out, uh, doing the research necessary to before even launching a, you know, AI features or building infrastructure. Uh, and now we're about to launch the actual features that, you, that users might use. Um, but these are the three reasons why we've invested in it and why we think it can help a lot of companies. First, um, monitoring performance and reporting is really time consuming. Um, so in that same study, um, we saw that 75% of companies in the total sample are creating five plus reports per month. So it's kind of what you talked about, Mark, in that each department is kind of building their own report. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the right way to go. It's not how we do it. I actually have two people in our organization and that's what they do is they work with all the different stakeholders in the organization to identify the metrics that should be tracking. And then at the end of every month, I'm reviewing in a deep dive all functions that even, and they're reviewing, of course, on a daily, weekly basis. So um, so I don't think this is the right approach. I recommend one report per month per organization. You might have to break it up for length reasons, um, but for the most part, um, and that's actually how HubSpot does it as well internally. Uh, HubSpot uh, in the early days 
um, realized that we needed one report every month that explained everything that was going on in our business. And that that report grew and grew and grew as the business grew. Um, keep in mind, I was there from like, you know, uh, year one when I was 15th employee. So that deck started out really small. And by the time I left nine years later, it was voluminous. Um, but what we would do is as we issues would occur in our business or as we uh, add um, functions in our business, that deck would grow. Um, the, the most important thing it did, it was help us determine, are we are we off track on somewhere? Do we need to course correct? Do we need to reallocate investments, et cetera? And so it's important, I think, to have that kind of God view in your business. But back to back to why AI is important here. Um, it's really time consuming, right? So in our study, uh, companies are spending at least uh, three to five hours. Uh, and these are smaller businesses, uh, much bigger businesses are spending way more time um, uh, and creating lots of reports. So that's number one reason why uh, we believe AI can help um, help with this problem. Two, there's so much data everywhere. Um, you know, I, I'm sure there's a lot of HubSpot users on this call. We're a HubSpot user. There's a lot of good data in HubSpot, but I still rely on lots of other tools in our in in our business. I'm sure you do too, right? We use on Google Analytics for a deeper dive on our content performance, Search Console, SEMrush, and Ahrefs uh, for SEO. We're using all the social platforms, organic social platforms. Uh, we have deeper analytics using Mixpanel for our product, We're using Intercom for our chat because it's a better chat tool. On and on and on, um, the different tools that we're using. Uh, our average customers using about 11 different tools uh, in their uh, in their account. So uh, lots of different data. Uh, it's almost impossible for any single human to really even track all this, let alone understand it. Um, and, and that it's, makes, yeah. Let's do a quick poll. If everyone can just throw in how many uh, tools they think they're using that are connected to their CRM or, you know, around what, what Pete's showing here. Just throw in the number while we kind of carry on talking. It'll be interesting to see on average. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that it's more than one or two. Just to, if anyone wants to start yeah, throwing in. There's a in lot of tools, tools that you don't need to connect to your CRM. Right? There's very little value in connecting, say, SEMrush to your CRM, for example, uh, or Search Console to your, your CRM. But you do need to connect yeah. to your reporting tools. Yes. Yeah, of course, depending on what you're using for your reporting. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, I'm just, I'm just saying eight, there's lots 10, of tools nine. outside of your CRM that you might be collecting data in as well. But looks like, yeah, so maybe just shy of our 11 mark, but uh, for, for a handful of people here, but yeah, seven, eight, nine, 10, where is the answers we're getting? So um, I bet if you asked three of your coworkers to list out the tools where they, at least once a month, check data, I bet you the number will be almost twice as big as you're thinking of right now, uh, especially when you start to look at, say, HR and finance and other, other departments. Um, but yeah. Uh, so it. lots so. of data. I think we all agree there's lots of data. So here's just a, like a crazy, crazy number. So at Databox, we built 115 integrations with other tools. Um, we have 550,000 companies that have connected um, data. Uh, that includes about 20,000 customers on a on a paid plan or companies on a paid plan. We also have many more free users. And every day we're pulling 2.5 terabytes of data from 25 million API requests. So. Um, you know, that's a relatively small number of companies in the, in the, in the, you know, in the scheme of the economy, for example, and the amount of data just being produced there is, is absolutely ridiculous. Um, crazy. And, you know, these are some of the integrations that we, that we have. Uh, there's a longer list here if you want to check them out. Um, but you know, there's, we we have like about, like I said, about 115 integrations out of the box. People integrate other tools through third-party services as well. Um, but there's literally thousands of tools. And I know you, you've you seen it, Mark, but like um, Scott Brinker's MarTech map where there's like, I think I think it's like up to 15,000 companies um, on that map um, that are just in the marketing, in the marketing software space. So there's just a ridiculous amount of data being produced. Um, this is uh, at Databox, we try to make it as easy as possible. Um, and up until launching our AI tools, our, our whole focus has been on like building these integrations and making it easy as possible for people to build reports and dashboards. Uh, and that's kind of a necessary first step. And one of the reasons why um, we're uniquely positioned to build this, uh, uh, build AI, these AI features that I'm about to share with you all is that um, when we build an integration, we predefine metrics that you would expect. So if you use, HubSpot, for example, you would expect to get in there and see sessions and pages per session 
uh, leads, MQLs, deals created, deals close one, deals close one amount, sales cycle, et cetera. Like, and so we predefine those. And because we have tens of thousands of data uh, HubSpot users using us, we actually have uh, a really probably the second largest um, database of HubSpot data uh, after HubSpot, right? In terms of being able to not just see um, what one company does, but we can see how lots of companies perform on all these metrics. And it'll, 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 I'll share it in a bit how that helps us think, do things like benchmarking, data correlations, and, and other AI power features. Um, but back to the reason, another reason why AI um, is, it, I think, is important to be applied here is that many, many people are just not comfortable with numbers. Uh, I'm an engineer, I have a chemical engineering degree. I did mechanical engineering, robotics, process design, et cetera. After college, I went back and got a degree in computer programming. It's, I am extremely comfortable with math. That's why I do what I do. I really love it. I know I'm a very, very small percentage of the population, even amongst you know business professionals, uh, are very uncomfortable, um, uh, you know, with with math. Um, this young woman here, Tori, she's she's uh, a few years older now. Uh, she's had her first child, but this is a, a picture of her and her family. Baseball game, obviously, um, and uh, she's an actuary. Uh, she was the first hire I made when I joined DataBox, uh, and she's now my chief of staff and director of revenue operations. Uh, and she studied actuarial math in in school, uh, and so she uh, she she's obviously also very uh, mathematically inclined. Um, and she actually sent a paper. She told me this story the other day. She sent a paper to her mother, who's this lovely woman here. Uh, in college uh, that she was really proud of that she was doing as part of her actual actuarial math degree. And her mother's response was, we have nothing in common. Um, and so <laughs> there are math people and there are not math people. Uh, unfortunately, I think in the US at least, um, children are sort of sorted early on as like math people and creative people. I think that's awful. Yeah, um, here as but, well. I think yeah, it's everywhere okay. in the world. Yeah, uh, probably it's all the yeah, teacher's so. fault if it's like, ah, you're not yeah. great at math, go and, go and do something yeah. else. I have so many stories. My sister um, was struggling in math in like middle, middle school. And my parents went and talked to the teacher. Uh, it was at a Catholic school. She sat down with a nun. And the nun's response after my parents were pressing on her on how to help my sister get better, do better, do she was doing fine, but they wanted to do better in math. The, the nun said, don't worry. She's a girl. She doesn't need to understand math. So um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that nun's retired at this point. She certainly didn't surprise, survive uh, the Me Too movement. Um, uh, but yeah, that was just awful, right? For something, some, something, some, a, a, ter a teacher to say, right? So I think we're all sorted. And unfortunately, math is hard. AI, I believe, we believe, can take the math um, and start to um, start to make sense of it. Um, and so I'm going to jump in here to the, the last piece and share some of the ways with, that AI can help, unless you have any questions. Or no, 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 I think, I think, yeah, that would be great. Go for it. I think everyone's already realized that that's a part of our day in life and, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and even saving time in, you know, in data cleansing, making sure the data is, is, is clean, the operational side of the data before you actually get the analytics. I can re I can already see we're using it that AI, you know, saves a huge amount of time because just making sure that the data is clean or if you're migrating things over, it's a lot of stuff yeah. that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. That's going to make a big change. And then obviously, as you said, that's always been a headache, preparing everything and trying to understand. So yep. it, it's kind of a, a no-brainer if, if, yeah. if we can get to that level. Or oh, We're already there, I think. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's talk about it. So about two years ago is when uh, the product team, our whole team really got together and said, how can we start using AI? The founder, who's the chief product officer at Databox, um, started um, working with a handful of universities. We ended up recruiting a few PhD data scientists. So collectively, we started looking at what's available from a machine learning model, an AI model that we can apply to data and, and help people make smarter or simpler decisions. Um, Gonna go through this quickly, but um, some of you may be familiar with Hugh McLeod. Uh, he writes um, business cartoons. If you haven't heard of him, check out Gaping Void. Like I guarantee you'll find a cartoon there that you'll that you'll enjoy. This is one he did a while ago. Uh, it did not have data box and customer in it. That's something we added. But most organizations have a lot of data. It's undefined, right? It's just in tables. 
it's in applications. Um, they're not necessarily thinking about how do they use that data. Once you start to label that data and say, this is this number means leads, new leads this month, right? Then you can start to actually call it information. Once you start connecting those dots and saying, hey, um, this metric is connected to this metric somehow, then you can start to uh, understand correlations and, 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 and get knowledge. You, if you figure out the path from one metric to multiple metrics, right? And through to multiple metrics, that's when you realize, hey, our activity on LinkedIn actually produces really good sales for us, right? But there's four or five metrics that, are, that you got to kind of understand before you can actually make that conclusion mathematically. Um, and then um, once you really draw those lines and make those conclusions, that's when you have wisdom and you, and you have insights. So most companies, you have to do all of this stuff, right? Uh, and as a result, most of the time, you really need to hire knowledgeable people with wisdom already to come in and look at your data and make sense of it, which makes it really complicated. And so what Databox is trying to do is do these first four steps. You still have to have some wisdom, know what you're looking at in order and have some practical experience to draw the insights. But uh, what Databox is trying to do is make sense of a lot of that for you to kind of short, shorten that process. Um, so here are the five things that are thing and the five questions that they answer. The, the first one is uh, benchmarks. As I mentioned earlier, when we build an integration, we define metrics uh, so that they are universally defined across companies. Uh, so for example, uh, we have um, thousands, like tens of thousands of Google Analytics uh, users uh, in our system, tens of thousands of HubSpot users, tens of thousands of Facebook ads, Google ads, et cetera. And so we can go in and say that the cost per click that this company is getting is lower than this company is getting, and it's a certain number. So I'll dive into some of these each individually in a bit, but that's what benchmarks mean. We're also benchmarking business processes. So since for the last six years, uh, we've been running surveys to ask companies, how do they do certain things? Uh, like the, biz the business state of business reporting that I shared earlier, but on lots and lots of different topics. And we've done it more than 1,300 for 1,300 topics. Uh, and so we're using that data as well as generative AI to help feed recommendations to users. They won't be perfect. Once again, our customers and our partners will have to make sense of those and, and, and make sure that they make sense. Just like you don't want to go to, to chat GPT and say, write me a term paper or write me a blog post. You need to actually do some research, give it the right prompts, check the accuracy of what it's doing, apply and, and edit, uh, edit and add your own perspective, et cetera. All that stuff needs to happen. You can't do that. We won't be able to do that with recommendations, but we're moving in that direction to the point where we'll be able to give companies good recommendations. Next up is, it's, being, oh, go ahead. No, I just wanted to add, someone told me something very interesting yesterday. He says, the right way to talk about prompts and for the marketing people, it's easier, is to have a very specific brief. Yes. Yes, exactly. So that's your recommendation. Yeah, that's our first stop in our content process is we write a, we will call it a research brief actually. Um, yeah, so we'll, yes. we'll need that for the AI, for the recommendations. Yes. You're going to have yes. a specific brief. Got it. You'll need to answer questions and yes, you'll need to filter through recommendations, et cetera. It's not going to be, we, we have not, we have not reached uh, general, what, is, what do they call it? Uh, uh, general artificial intelligence. There's some term for basically when the matrix will take over. Um, yeah, we're not there yet. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Getting it. <laughs> so I'm going to breeze through this because I'm going to go into each one on a slide and we can we can stop and talk about each one. But the, the third question is, what should we do today, right? You wake up in the morning and hopefully you have a task list that you've thought about maybe Sunday night or at least the previous day. But um, it's difficult for you to look at all the data in your business and make that decision. And so the idea is the data will be able to help you inform you and identify the activities that you should do today that will impact future performance. Forecasting, it is what it is. It shouldn't just be for revenue. You should be forecasting multiple metrics in your business. Uh, and so this will allow forecasting on, on different for different types of metrics. Uh, and then anomaly detection. Once we have a forecast model, we can say, hey, you should you, your lead volume should be at this point by the end of the quarter. Uh, as soon as it starts to deviate from that path or it's not on trend to that, that's when, it, when you have an anomaly. So when something's out of bounds of the forecast. Um, and so a system... Imagine a system that's monitoring hundreds or thousands of metrics for you so that you don't have to and telling you which ones might be underperforming or also helping you identify the things that are doing going well that you can celebrate as well. It's not all, all negative. Uh, there are tools like this that web developers use there um, that 
monitor uptime of little bits of code in the in an app, for example, and they couldn't do their job without that. Whenever there's a spike in activity on a specific API or something like that, there's no way they'd know that unless there was some monitoring in place. So imagine, imagine having that kind of monitoring for your whole business, for your marketing activities, your sales activities, customer support activities, your retention, your financial metrics, et cetera. Uh, and that's the idea. All these together, we believe can help companies build and then execute a growth plan and then iterate on that on a regular basis like they should. So instead of just monitoring your performance, this tool will monitor, help monitor the performance and help you iterate on your strategy and your execution. So here's an example of benchmarks. You can actually um, get benchmarks very quickly. And I forgot to update a slide here. I'll share at the end uh, how you can get these benchmarks from uh, Penguin. They actually have their own group. Um, but if you focus in on this, on this, um, on this chart here, what it's showing is a distribution of performance for aerospace and defense, B2B. Of course, all aerospace and defense is B2B for companies of this size. Um, this is fake. This is a fake mock-up, although this is a real product and you can check it out. Um, uh, I'll, sh I'll share the, the link later um, as well. Um, and, and the idea here is for you to see how are you performing against other companies and it'll actually tell you that you're outranking either X percent or Y percent or you're underperforming by Y percent. So the idea is you can drill them by company size, industry, um, or private groups, which um, P Penguin Strategies has, um, where you can compare yourself against very specific um, groups of companies. So Penguin has a group defined just for B2B tech and SaaS companies that allows them to see um, how mid-sized B2B tech and SaaS companies are performing, because that's a very different performance uh, uh, performance expectations than, say, a small local business or a Fortune 500 company, right? Um, the next thing will be recommendations. What should we do to, to improve performance? So again, we've been running these surveys to uh, amongst experts. We have a sample of thousands of people who have, have given us uh, how they do things in surveys. We use that to create content over the years, um, but we're also using that to, to feed our recommendation engine and identify uh, exactly the things that companies can do to improve performance on specific metrics. So this is just some data we have, say, on Facebook ads um, and uh, and how you can do that. We also make this data publicly available. Um, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll share that. Um, I actually have some data uh, that's exclusively available through, uh, through uh, Penguin Strategies Benchmark Group. All right, next up. Um, how can we better influence our performance today? So data correlations automatically detect the metrics that are correlated. So if you're really good at, say, content marketing, you're going to know that certain metrics are correlated to one another. You're going to know that if your bounce rate is high and your time on page is low, that your conversion rate of to lead is going to be low, going to be low also, right? You, you're going to know that if your lead volume goes down, your deal volume is going to go down. Um, there are hundreds and hundreds of correlations, though, that 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 can happen. So, for example, let's say, say your company is relying on three traffic sources. You're reliant on uh, organic traffic, paid traffic, and um, social organic traffic, or what most people call dark social because you can't measure it very well. But imagine uh, you have some self-reported attribution, you have some website attribution in there, so you can start to get a feel and measure those three channels really well. Um, what happens if one of those dips um, in a day, um, you might not notice it, or in a week, you might not notice it. The idea here is that correlations will know that there should be a relationship between that and, and can identify that, hey, um, you should be focused in on these top of funnel metrics so that you can uh, impact uh, the bottom of funnel metrics. Um, and imagine being able to do that across all the different tools. You'd be able to look at, say, how your search console data correlates to your HubSpot data, correlates to your, your, your NetSuite data, et cetera. Uh, and start to put a complete picture together of what metrics correlate and impact each other. Um, so that's the idea. Data correlations, forecasting. Once again, I think most of you know about forecasting because most sales orgs are going to do forecasting. Um, most are still doing it very manually. They're relying on the salesperson to say, hey, this is uh, a, it has an 80% chance of closing. Um, every company should do that. We do that as well. Um, but uh, there's also lots of other metrics that uh, you should be forecasting as well, such as your website traffic or your lead volume or your qualified lead volume or uh, potential uh, uh, churn or, or uh, if you're a SaaS business, for example. Uh, and so those those metrics can be forecasted by looking at the historical data as well as uh, correlations 
uh, from leading indicators. So if you know, for example, that um, uh, your NPS, your net promoter score, the how your customers rate you uh, has gone down, uh, and you know that that's, we know that the system knows that that's correlated to your retention, then your forecast for retention would also uh, go down. Um, so uh, those are the kind of things that that uh, every company should be forecasting and, and keep an eye on. It allows them to make take action today. Uh, and so, then I need to deep dive into the specific yeah. company that brought that down and then see yes. what's happening. Yes. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, it could be like in our business, we do hundreds of transactions a month. So it's never one company that matters. It's usually, you know, sales team uh, is, is having an issue. Uh, for some reason, the lead flow is, is dropped or the qualified lead flow is dropped. So there's always other things besides just say that that customers off. Right. Um, but but yeah, exactly. It's, it's, Assume the other way around. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. yeah. The next thing is what issues do we need to address now? So, again, once you have a forecasting model. Um, now you know how you should be performing in the future. So when when you're not performing that way, uh, that as expected, that's an anomaly. And so um, what anomaly detection will do is monitor your data and identify when things are down or up, um, so that you can um, so that you can address those or celebrate them if it's up. <laughs> uh, and then putting it all together, I think most of you on this call, if you're on this call, you probably use ChatGPT or some other generative AI. Um, and so, uh, obviously, the obvious uh, uh, application of that in our business is to help people produce reports. Uh, so that's one thing that we're working on. We're we're not quite ready to launch for this, but the idea here is that um, our report builder will come with suggestions on how you should explain your data. Um, and so, we already have a report builder. You can go in and manually type these things, and you can insert um, timelines, met values, increases, etc right in the text um, so that you don't have to look up a number on a on a spreadsheet or look up a number on a chart and then type it in your paragraph. It automatically gets generated for you. Then you can go in manually add your um, your your own analysis or your own recommendations to it as well. Um, but this will get much smarter over time uh, as we apply generative AI to it. Um, so that's that's what we're launching. It'll actually launch in a few weeks. We're calling it our growth plan. Uh, includes all this stuff. Uh, we'll include all this stuff. Uh, as we launch it, um, and uh, yeah, uh, and I have a hoping... question. Yeah, can you go back two slides just to show the this, this one? one? Yeah. So obviously, sessions up year by over year. We talked about it at the beginning. Uh, one of the seven habits is to, on a daily basis, and you know, monthly and quarterly, to kind of look at it. So if I'd be using the the uh, this line of you know AI already pushing the data and I have this outcome of you know on a uh, week to week we're at X sessions for my website and from the previous period so I would use it that way so that in essence I wouldn't have to go and scramble and start looking at all the different dashboards and trying to put this together I would go into one or two places and actually have those insights in front of me. Uh, based on anomalies, based on the, the everything that you're pushing together, and then I would. That's where I would look at my. Yeah, I wouldn't use our reports feature for that. I'd re, I'd use our dashboards feature, which, as you know, is like a full screen thing. Um, allows you to put different metrics on there, change the visualizations, change the timeline. So, um, and then and then string them together, so you can have like you can start with your marketing dashboard and you go to your sales dashboard and etc. And you can in a meeting pop that up and look at live data change inputs on the fly so you can say hey you know it looks like we're down week over week on our website traffic um but let's look at let's change it and look at month over did month. something so happen we, that yeah we forgot to take into account that. yeah like did we miss a u.s holiday right like the u.s holiday screwed it up whatever um so and uh like so for example i often we often will have we'll always do we have set monthly goals um but a lot of times there'll be a holiday or um, the month will just be shorter. Like April, we only had 20 working days. Um, we're B2B business. So like our website traffic is nothing on the weekends and high on the weekdays. Uh, and so we missed our sessions target. So we looked at it and it's like, all right, well, let's just see if it's a trend. So we change it to last 30 days. And we would just see that the last 30 days, it's really no change. In fact, it was a small increase. Um, so um, so it's really just a, a factor that there was less, less, week, less days in the week. Less yeah, you got to be careful with that. It goes, I don't think anyone has that problem, but I remember, you know, a good, four or five, six years ago, we would always get to the first of the month and we would get these crazy calls. I've got no traffic. 
It's gone down to zero. Oh, yeah. I don't know what's yeah. happened. What happened to our Yeah, that's because the, the dashboard had 150 last month. month. Yeah. Now it's gone down to zero. <laughs> HubSpot's broken. <laughs> Yeah, well, we we had before a data box. You had to choose which which date range you want when you set up the dashboard. About three years ago, we launched what we call custom date ranges. It allows the viewer of the dashboard to just change the date range to whatever they want, which you imagine would be useful, but was not easy. It was a very difficult um, engineering problem because we're pulling that data from AP, from you know APIs from third party systems and time stamps live. And so yeah. so, anyways, it, it does it works that way now, where you can just toggle by the date range, do custom date ranges, etc. Got it. Okay. So the idea here is with AI, software should be able to tell you where your performance should be through benchmarks, uh, how to perform at that level through recommendations, why you're performing the way you are through data correlations to explain inputs and outcomes and outputs and all that stuff, um, how you're likely to perform through forecasting and when things are off track through anomaly detection. Um, so our hope is that that would make using data and analytics a lot easier. And instead of everybody feeling like math is hard, uh, they would think math is fun. Um, and uh, and that that's kind of our mission. Uh, if you're interested, um, check out our free training program. We talk about a lot of the seven habits in there um, and really give people a methodology that they can follow to start by picking the right metrics, thinking about how they're related, uh, setting goals, um, building dashboards, et cetera. It's a free, program, free training program, it's a few hours of investment of time uh, to go through it. Uh, a lot of our uh, customers and partners take it and it helps them have a common terminology internally when they're thinking about how to use data. It's not about, hey, you should look at this metric. It's about having a framework for how you um, at, you know pick your metrics and then have a cadence for reviewing uh, and reporting on those on those metrics. Um, but great things are in business are never done by one person, done by a team, right? St famous Steve Jobs quote. I highly recommend you go talk to Penguin. Um, we have a partnership um, that's gone back for years now, but a more recent uh, thing that we've done where we've uh, allowed them to uh, build a bench group, benchmark group. They can define exactly who's in their benchmark group. Uh, they have a bunch of B2B tech and SaaS companies in that benchmark group. So if you're B2B tech and SaaS, um, go check out their group. Um, you can either go to this bit.ly. Um, so I'll let you read that um, or just contact Penguin and they can invite you to the group. Uh, they have 20, actually 25 members as of this morning um, in their group. What you'll get is you'll you'll basically join the group and you can connect uh, any number of these tools, Google Analytics, um, Microsoft Ads, Google Ads, HubSpot Marketing, or HubSpot CRM. And then you can see how you're performing against these other companies um, in different metrics like this. Um, again, this is a benchmark chart. I'll take uh, average session duration. This is actually data boxes data. Um, and you can see that our uh, bounce rate, uh, or I'm sorry, average session duration is uh, lower than the medium, right? We're 46% of the company in the group with a one minute, 18 second duration. You can see that our um, sessions are very high, our users are very high, right? So we're doing well on those metrics. Um, if I showed you the full report, you see our bounce rate is also high. Um, and so things that we're working on based off of this data is we're working on reducing our bounce rate in order to improve our conversions, right? Um, and, and so using this data, we can be smart about the strategy that we follow. Uh, same thing for you, right? If you can see how you're performing against similar companies on a bunch of different metrics, you can see, hey, maybe we're outperforming in marketing and underperforming in sales or vice versa, right? We're, uh, we're, we're doing great in sales, but underperforming in marketing and maybe a shift in, mar in towards marketing might help you grow even faster, right? So this allows you to see how you're doing. Again, it's uh, exclusive to, to um, anyone, uh, to Penguin. So Penguin will have to decide whether they want to let you in there. But uh, I imagine if you contact them, they'll be cool with that. 